thank you for being a guest here at calmclass.com. This website is dedicated to one thing, to be able to give you a different mindset. To be able to stay calm in tough times is by changing how you think, because when you change how you think, it changes how you live. My name is Dwight Bain. I'll be your host through most of these lessons, but I'm really glad that you found us. I'm really glad that you're taking time out to watch a lesson that will be life-changing. So do this. Take good notes. Download the study guides. Let these life application principles make your life a better place. And then would you let us know how this is helping you? My thanks to you for watching. My thanks to our incredible team for making it happen. But most of all, my thanks to God because he gives us principles that will change our life if we use them. Are you ready? Let's get started. It's already been a great morning. Let's dig in and learn some things to keep growing. Join me in prayer. Father, thank you for these friends and those that join us worldwide on, at calmclass.com. We take time out to be able to stop and learn about Christian attitude because if you have the right attitude, it's easier to manage your life. Christian attitude and life management. Thank you for those visitors who are here today, those that will hear about this at some point in the future. I may not even be here, but your words live on, dear Father. So use today's lesson to change hearts, but God, most of all, use it to change mine. And we pray in Jesus' name. So to those that are here in the live audience in Orlando, we've already heard from Dr. Ben Carson, some wonderful challenges and some wonderful thought-provoking ideas. I hope you had a lot of takeaways. I'm writing down lots of different things that I'll tweet and post in the days ahead. What a wonderful idea when you stop to talk to another person, all of a sudden and listen to their ideas, you humanize them and you don't demonize them. What a great series of thoughts. So if you heard that in Orlando, you've already been stretched in your thinking, but um, I, I have to tell you, and I wanted to confess this in front of my, my mom and my dad who are here, I have a mad crush, and it will never be fulfilled. I mean, by God's grace uh, for my adult life, I've had an interesting job, and because of the media, I've had an opportunity to meet interesting people. And when you meet interesting people, uh, I learned this a long time ago, you always come with, with, with a list of questions because those questions allow you to see into the life of that individual. And so I've had an opportunity to, to have conversations like that and meet some heroes, but one of my mad crushes has gone away. Sheila knows about it and she told me not to worry uh, because it would never happen anyway. I was too short because my mad crush was six feet tall. And she was Mocha, and her name was Maya Angelou. I mean, I've had a chance to talk to Colin Powell and, and Alex Haley, who wrote Roots, to be able to have conversations with Rudy Giuliani and conversations with Bill Cosby. Interesting people. One of the most interesting individuals that you will talk to in your lifetime who has a story about everyone is sitting right there. His name is Pat Williams. Because... When he received the Lifetime Achievement Award from House of Hope, every person that had already previously received the award, Ronald Reagan, Sandy Pat, I mean, Pat had a story about everybody, about the interesting uh, conversations that you can have when you cross paths. But I have a list, an actual list of interesting people I'd like to meet and ask, how did you get through that? And Maya was on the list. She's gone, if you don't know her, or you don't know that name, she was America's Poet Laureate, this is what her son said about her um, when she passed, that she passed peacefully. She was 86. And here's some things about Miss Maya. As a teenager, her love for the arts won her a scholarship to study dance and drama at a school in San Francisco. At the age of 14, she dropped out to become San Francisco's first African-American female cable car conductor. She finished high school while pregnant with her son, Guy. She went on to become the author of over 30 best-selling books, the most popular, I know, by The Caged Bird Sings. And she told stories about overcoming hardship, stories of overcoming major problems. And you see, to me, that's, that's a real takeaway I want you to have from our lesson today, or if you're watching at calmclass.com. Because when you think about it, 
everybody in this room has problems. In fact, turn to some of the people at your table here in the live audience and turn to them and just look at them and say, you, you've got problems. You've got problems. Just go ahead and try it. I want to go there. Um, now, now, to keep it honest, to keep it honest, turn to the person on the other side and say, the reason for your problems is you're sitting next to me. Okay. <laughs> That's funny. Look how long you've been sitting there. No. But I'm, I was My adult side. life, over three decades, I have spent helping people solve problems. All right, so I see problems not as something horrible at all. I've learned to see problems as a puzzle. Now, the reason I told Sheila about my mad crush is because she really was my first mad crush in 1979, and she's still my mad crush today. But I just was so fascinated with, how do you go from being an African-American woman in the 1950s, not a lot of career opportunities, and how do you go from that to America's Poet Laureate, to over 50 honorary doctorates, to winning virtually every award a person can win? Because instead of seeing life as a series of, listen to me, it's not in your study guide, instead of seeing life as a series of problems, I would challenge you to see life as a series of puzzles. The reason I mentioned Sheila is because, I don't know why, maybe she was dropped on her head as a child. She thinks it's entertaining to get these puzzles, Ruth, with like a thousand pieces. And we, we go away to some nice place, you know, a beach or a mountain resort, and there's like scenery. Even better, even better. There's like new books. There's always bookstores in airports. I've noticed this. And so I've learned because of my friendship with Pat, to always be picking up a book and always have, you know, 10 books going. I've actually seen the closet in his house, which has, what is it, had 400 books that you're waiting to read? I mean, it's just stacked as full as it can be. And so I'm happy to go to the bookstores. And she's happy to go find a puzzle from wherever we're at. And then we'll get back to the resort. And instead of, like, hanging out, you know, by the fire, and she'll say, let's put this puzzle together. And it would be like, you don't understand the concept of romantic getaway. Okay, let me, let me help you with this. We are not in this play. And what I learned is that by working together on a puzzle, it makes you closer as a couple. It's really interesting. The only part I don't understand, because I get it now, solving a puzzle gives you more confidence. It's one of the greatest things you can do to prevent getting Alzheimer's, which every other person over the age of 80, the Florida Department of Elder Affairs says every other person over the age of 80 will get Alzheimer's, and we don't even know what causes it. But we know one of the things, thank you, Barbara. <laughs> Barbara said junk food. Here's what we do know. If you keep your mind active, your brain keeps working. If you sit and you veg with a remote control in your hand, then, then, then I'm hoping that you have stock in depends because your brain, as it starts to dissolve, you'll just sit there and your body will dissolve. You have to stay active, but in particular, you have to keep your brain active. If you can see life as a series of puzzles to solve, you get stronger. If you see life as a series of problems, African-American woman in the 1950s, child out of wedlock, no money, working at every possible job. The great thing I loved about Maya, because I read all of her stuff, is, is that she lived long enough, I love this, to write not just one, but four autobiographies. I just finished the last one a few weeks before she died. And I thought, isn't that the great idea to just keep living long enough? And her, her last one wasn't just uh, an autobiography, it was an autobiography, you'll love this, Barbara, built around mealtime. So it would include recipes that she would have when she first met Oprah Winfrey. And it recipes, and it would have stories built around the kitchen. Because isn't that where we go to connect with people? Don't we go to connect with people in our kitchens? And by working together on different meals, and she had the most wonderful stories of different people that she had met, and she had several homes, and she would, when she got to know them, she would say, you come with me to the kitchen and let's cook. Because one of her first jobs with, as a single mom was being able to cook uh, Cajun food. The problem was she was from the South and she didn't know how to cook Cajun food, but she was starving and that paid $75 a week, which was big money at a Cajun restaurant. So she went and she taught herself how to cook and she did that because there's always money to be made if you're a good cook, right? 
<coughs> she saw her life as a series of puzzles. Do you? That's what we're talking about today, because if you'll take a look into your study guide, you'll see that there's a big maze and there is a puzzle. Because I wanted to plant the idea to see life as a series of puzzles to solve instead of seeing life as a series of problems. I was talking this last week after a speaking event and uh, working with uh, individuals that are helping, uh, people who've lost jobs, people who've gone through foreclosure. And I said, one of the things we have to give people who've lost jobs and homes is to help them to see that your life is not brick and mortar. Your life is not your job. Suicide is the 10th leading cause of death in the United States. Listen to me. It's not even a cause of death in other parts of the world. Because in other parts of the world, people say, why would I do that? But in this country, people have what are called first world problems. Have you heard of these? Yes. Third world problems, developing world problems are things like food, clean water, safety, that your children don't get sold into slavery. These are called first world problems. They're multiple websites. A first world problem is, is being angry that somebody said something about you on Facebook. A first world problem is, is, is not being able to lose that five pounds to fit into a particular outfit that you want to wear to a reunion. Uh, a first world problem is they ran out of the DVD box set of your favorite show down at Target and you're so angry about it you want to sue Target. First world problem is being worried about zombie apocalypses. <laughs> I'm not making this up. The Center for Disease Control in Atlanta actually last year, right before Halloween, released a press release where they had actors dressed up, not making this up, as zombies, and the CDC said, here's what to do in case of a zombie apocalypse. It went viral, and the government had to come back in mea culpa and say, it was just a Halloween joke. But this is what you do in case of a natural disaster, like fire or flood or tornado. First world problem, could there be a zombie apocalypse? Well, unless your family Thanksgiving is more entertaining than mine, no. I mean, it, it may be that maybe your family, maybe there are zombies there. I don't know. But I can tell you real world problems, real world problems, to those who are creative and use the great brain that God gave them, are just a puzzle to put together. You say, Dwight, you don't understand my financial problems, my relationship problems. You don't understand the problems of my past. Listen to me. See it as a series of puzzles. God delights. It is the glory of a king to search out a matter, King Solomon said. God delights in letting us figure out puzzles. If you see it as a series of problems, all of a sudden Miller time makes more sense. Or zombie apocalypses. You know, it's interesting in America, the number one thing we export now is entertainment. And the interesting thing is that the same problems, because America used to be the most overweight uh, the, 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 the most debt-laden, but congratulations. Now, parts of Europe, parts of the developing world, people have clinical obesity, diabetes, they have the same debt problems. Wouldn't it be great if we could export, as Dr. Carson talked about this morning, the hope and the freedom that is America? Instead of exporting, hey, guess what the desperate housewives are going to do this week? Well, you know what? If those desperate housewives would maybe solve the puzzles in their life, they wouldn't have to poison their husbands. You know, I mean, it's, it's like the old joke I heard of the guy who, his first wife died from eating poison mushrooms, and his second wife died from eating poison mushrooms, and his third wife died, Florence, from a, a blow to the head because she wouldn't eat her mushrooms. I mean, there are some people that spend all of their time just being so angry that they're not spending all of their time fixing their life. That's what this lesson is about. Ben Stein is uh, not just an actor, but he's a good thinker. He has a list, he calls it, my list of self-destruction 101. Here we go. He said, these are the things in Hollywood that cause the greatest destruction. Number one is delusional thinking. Delusional thinking is being able to say, I'm right, you're wrong. I mean, for instance, it's delusional to think that Powerball, which has you know, $650 million, now do the math. If tickets are a dollar a piece and 650 and the, and, the, and the lottery jackpot is based on how many people bought a ticket, do the math with me. What are your odds if 650 million people paid a dollar? What are your odds of winning? One and how many? 650 million, Janet. Very good. All right. Your odds of almost anything being eaten by a shark 
at SeaWorld. I mean, I don't know. Your, your, your odds of anything, a plane falling out of the sky because Godzilla, your odds of anything are better than winning that Powerball. So why do you give the dollar? I'll tell you why. Psychologically, because people want to go into fantasies to escape the hardship of their life. And if I had $650 million, I wouldn't have problems. That is a lie from the pit of hell, and it smells like smoke. Let me tell you, <laughs> brothers and sisters, you win $650 million, you have more problems than you could possibly imagine. Every cousin you never knew you had, every illegitimate child shows up for it with a DNA test in their hand. You have problems like you never thought you had problems. Oh, yeah. Winnings like that are taxed at 50%. That's why so many people win a big amount of money, and they go spend it all, and they forget April 15, the tax man is coming, right? Wouldn't it be great if we taught people how to think? It's interesting, a guy will take a job promotion that involves, or a gal, that involves traveling 40 weeks a year for an extra $40,000 a year, and they'll think this is a good trade. But if you do the math, if you're gone 40 weeks a year, what happens to your children? What happens to your relationship with your significant other? They go find another significant other. Your children grow up without a parent, and it creates serious problems. Rehab for anorexia to try to save a girl's life is $80,000. Traditional drug rehab is about $30,000. Wouldn't it have been easier to maybe not, I mean, at least to sit back and look at it and say, 40,000, 40 weeks, that's a bad trade. That's not more money, that's more problems. See, if you can figure out a puzzle, if somebody, wouldn't it be wonderful if people, instead of, uh, last night my son and I went to the Huey Lewis um, uh, concert, Huey Lewis in the News. I mean, we found the power of love, baby. It was great to see a guy in his 60s after 10 p.m. One, awake. I mean, and that, was, that was impressive by itself. But to be able to just be rocking the stage for an hour and a half, and the audience chant, you know, thousands, you know, thousands, thousands of people just packed, chanting for more, and being able to see, man, here's a guy. But wouldn't it, wouldn't it be great if people would think? Because as my son and I were leaving at Universal Studios, as we were leaving, it's probably 11:30, and we saw the loneliest group of people you can imagine, particularly the girls dressed in next to nothing, coming in for those clubs by themselves. And I said to my son, who's a college student, how sad and lonely must your life be that you put on next to nothing so you can get into a club to maybe meet some guy who's going to solve all of your problems. Because you're going to find the right guy and it's going to solve your problems. And I wanted to stop because there were, I mean, there were hundreds coming in as we were leaving. You've seen it, Craig. I mean, there's... And I wanted to hold up a sign that said, finding a guy at a place like that is not going to solve your problems. It will give you some new ones. Now, the thing that really bugs me, because one of the places she and I went a lot, um, because she likes puzzles, and it was, a, I mean, and so you leave the puzzle for the next guest, right? And so there'd be, like, lots of puzzles left from previous visitors to this resort. The thing I didn't like is when somebody... <clears throat> would take pieces from one puzzle box. Stop laughing, Ruth. You did it, didn't you? You were the one who did it. I know. I can see the look on your face. That's why you're laughing. Because if you mix up the puzzle pieces, and then I'm married to an organized woman who says, well, this will help the next guest. Let's just, and it's like, can you see there's an ocean outside? We should go do something besides work on puzzles. I'll never get Alzheimer's. I may die from frustration first, right? All right, Ben Stein. Number one, delusional thinking. Number two, not producing. Not producing. Listen to some of these excuses of people. Because it seems like that more and more people just don't want to work. These are actual excuses given to supervisors at work. If it's all the same to you, I won't be into work today because the voices in my head told me to stay home and clean all the guns. That one's kind of scary. Actual excuses turned in by actual employees. My stepmother has come back as one of the undead. I must hunt her down and drive a wooden stake through her heart to give her eternal peace. One day off should do it. Uh, I can't come into work today because I'm stalking my previous boss who fired me for not showing up, okay? That one's creepy. That's scary. 
This is, th 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 listen to this one. The psychiatrist said it was an excellent session. He even gave me this jaw restraint so I won't bite things when I'm startled at work. <laughs> <laughs> the dog ate my car keys and we are hitchhiking to the vet. Actual work excuses. I'm stuck in the blood pressure machine at the Piggly Wiggly. Can't get to work. And this one just, uh, you just have to, you have to stay with this one to understand it. Constipation has made me a walking time bomb. Okay, actual oh, work oh, excuses. Oh, oh. Not producing. Number three, manipulative friends. Or to manipulate friends. That is a way to absolutely, that is a way to absolutely lose friends. Don't manipulate friends. Take care of your friends. The next one, bad manners. Bad manners. Have you noticed how these things just rule people's lives? Mm -hmm. Cell phone etiquette should be taught everywhere. That's just bad manners. Kindergarten. Yeah, kindergarten, really. Well, <laughs> Sheila taught second grade this year, and, and literally every second grader had an iPhone. And I thought, man, these second graders must be high rollers. These seven-year-olds really are working wheeling deals. Now, they played a lot of Candy Crush. <laughs> but we live in a culture where good manners will open doors for you that you can't imagine. Uh, what, Pat, one of the books I went through this week was called Ahead of the Curve, a journalist, a British journalist, who went to Harvard Business School, and he wrote about the experience because he got a Harvard uh, MBA and then couldn't find a job. And so, you know, what does a journalist do? He writes a book about it. And, and, and there was a whole section of his takeaways from Harvard Business School, HBS. And he said, one of my takeaways, the secret to success in business return emails and phone calls that day. He said, because so many important people are so important, or they're busy playing Candy Crush, they don't have time to just do their jobs. Wow. Send thank you notes. What a novel concept. Good manners. Uh, number five, dressing for failure. <laughs> Isn't it interesting how many people go to job interviews now with their tats and their piercings and their green hair um, and, and wonder why SunTrust won't give them a job. The thing that's interesting to me, Don, I see you laughing, is that they get mad at SunTrust or Bank of America. Okay, so here's a real simple lesson. If you want to work in a bank and people dress a certain way, dress that way for the job interview. There's a tip. There's a takeaway for you. I mean, just dressing for failure instead of John Malloy's classic book, 1980, Dressing for Success. When I'm doing executive coaching and I go into a new environment, what's the first thing that executives look at when I walk in? My bald head? Shoes. Shiny shoes. Shiny shoes. That's why you go to the shoes, shoe shine place at the airport before you get into the car to go to wherever you're speaking. Because people from a certain generation pay attention to that. Now, I realize the cool thing now in Silicon Valley is to not wear shoes and to be like, you know, the hippies. But I didn't like the hippies when they came in 1960. <laughs> I didn't think they smelled that good. And, and I, don't know, I don't know why that one's coming back. But number six, bad attitude. I love this from Charlie, uh, Charlie Chap, uh, 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 Chaplin. He said, I have many problems in my life, but my lips don't know that. My lips are always smiling. I thought, what a great idea. What a good attitude. Number seven, needless arguing. These are called circle arguments. And a circle argument, a circle argument is, is being able to uh, have the same argument you had last week. All right, same argument. So it's like a husband argues about this, the wife argues about this, they have the same argument. Or the next week, they have the same argument with their daughter. You're not dressed appropriate. You never give me enough freedom. All right, that's just a circle because it ends up at the same place. That's just a needless argument. Think about it. If you just stop the circle, you'd get back some breath, and, and one day you're going to need that breath. And then uh, number eight, putting first things last. And would you write next to that faith? Because it's interesting in America, a lot of people... In fact, a lot of people are very happy to talk about money. You talk about money, you can get a crowd, but you know, the first thing, it's really interesting. If you knew that your life was going to end today, wouldn't it make sense to cram for exams? Wouldn't it make sense to spend some time getting to know God? Now take a look at this. Albert Schweitzer said, man must cease attributing his problems to his environment and uh, must learn again to exercise his will his personal responsibility, and would you circle it, his personal responsibility in the realm of faith and morals. Great thought. Wouldn't it be great if people spent as much time on their own morality and their own faith as they did worrying about if somebody at work likes them? 
if someone at work is going to make more money than them? Paying attention to your faith. Now, take a look. Which problems cause you the most pressure? See, there's a list. Finances, health, job, children, mate, taxes, war, impending doom, other people's opinion. Which of those do you think that people worry about the most? Which problem causes people the most problem? We have a number of visitors with us today, and it's a great opportunity for you to get to learn people's names. Mama always said, introduce yourself by saying, hi, my name is Dwight. You can say, hi, my name is Craig or Barbara, as the case may be. But introduce yourself to the people at your table, and then see if you can come up with what's the number one problem that people worry about. Go. So, what did you come up with? What are people's biggest problems? Their mother-in-law, what did you come up with, Tim? Respect. Respect? Or respect. Yeah. Being respected. What else? What did you come up with at your table? Loneliness. Yeah. Uh, Jay says loneliness. Loneliness. Mother Teresa said the biggest problem in America was loneliness. What else did you come up with? Biggest problems. Biggest problems. What the young people are faced with in the near future. What the young people are faced with in the near future. Uh, you, you, when I grew up, college degree equal financial success security. Today, college degree equals $100,000 in debt. And, and the likelihood, I'm speaking to a group of attorneys this week, and in doing the research from the American Bar Association, uh, it takes the average law school graduate. I mean, these are people who graduate, pass the bar. It takes them almost a year to find a job. The average law school graduate has about $100,000 in debt, and they can't even find a job, but their payments start in six months. It's a different world. And there are 50,000 new attorneys every year. Every year. I mean, just, you know, wow. That's part of the problem. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I shall not be saying that to the attorneys this week, Tim. Thank you for that helpful advice. I'll be the one thrown out. My friend Tim said that you're the problem. I did that once. I spoke for government employees. And I told a joke about government employees. They did not invite me back. I, I just thought it was the funniest joke. Anyway, when we think about problems, yeah. We came up with fear as in Yeah, Danny says false evidence appearing real, and, and people being afraid. Yeah, when we look at problems, remember, I want you to see problems as a series of puzzles to solve. To be able to do that, let's take a look into your study guide, because problems in life, my mom taught me this as a child, problems in life are not a crisis. I have actually, not making this up, uh, in the early days as a clinical psychological professional, I had somebody call saying, Rearrange your schedule. I have to see you today. It is a life or death crisis. It was back when I answered my own phone. And guess what the life or death crisis was? This lady had a bad haircut. Now, she had very pretty hair, and she'd gotten a bad haircut in color. And we rearranged the schedule. I thought it was really something serious. I said, let me help you. I have no hair. <laughs> your bad haircut, I have a no haircut. Come on. This is a crisis, and she was very unhappy with me, but I was more unhappy with her because a crisis is something you, you, you have to manage and get through. A problem is just a puzzle. And so I want you to take a look at this to be able to see the difference. A normal person facing an abnormal situation with a normal response, I mean, the most common thing people do in school shootings and bank robberies and workplace shootings is they pass out or they lose control of their bodily functions, uh, lose control of their bladder, lose control of their bowels because they just heard a gunshot at close range. That's a normal response. But look at this, a normal person facing an abnormal situation with an abnormal response. If you just got fired or your loved one just died or somebody just left you a note that says, I'm divorcing you after 20 years to leave with, with your best friend, even though I know that makes for interesting country songs, in real life, a normal person facing a hardship should have normal grief don't think it's manly to not show emotion. The Bible says Jesus was a man of sorrows. He was well acquainted with grief. And so a normal person facing an abnormal situation, an abnormal response is to say, I'm fine. It's not in your study guide, Helen, but you can write down. F-I-N-E, frustrated, insecure, neurotic, and emotional. All right, that's fine. So when somebody tells you they're fine, they're telling you that they're a frustrated, insecure, neurotic, emotional person. When I speak to firefighters and SWAT teams, they tell me the F stands for something else. I, I don't know what they're talking about, but I do know this. Problems are most affected by our perspective. Steve Jobs, uh, quoting from the biography uh, by the same name. Here's what Jobs said. 
He said, getting fired from Apple was the best thing that could have ever happened to me. The heaviness of being successful was replaced by the lightness of being a beginner again. I was less sure about everything. It freed me. Getting fired freed me to enter one of the most creative periods of my life. He shared that at a, at a speech at Stanford University in 2005. Getting fired was the best thing? Wow. It's a perspective issue. And when you take a look at perspective, look at what Henry Ford said. Most people spend time and energy going around, uh, going around problems instead of trying to solve them. And would you write next to that the word puzzle? Because if you can solve a problem, I mean, Henry Ford lived in fear of the day that General Motors would be able to have assembly line and interchangeable parts. And General Motors, you may remember, passed Ford. Oh, yeah, but during the bailout, Ford passed General Motors. Because Ford said, we can come up with a better system. We can come up with a better car. When you take a look at that, it's by solving problems. Would it be interesting if the Mickey Rooney's before he found Christ, eight, eight marriages? Wow. I mean, you know, his problem was, you know, he didn't pick well, right? You know, he just, or maybe the problem was solving the puzzle inside. I mean, you know, I, I saw a school note that was actually given to a, an administrator, Orange County Public School, back when I was on the advisory board for the, for the Orange County Schools. Actual note. And, and it was to get a child out of missing class. And it said, um, it was from the, the, the child's mom. And it said, I have been in bed with the doctor for three days. He don't do me no good. If things don't improve soon, I will have to send for another doctor. And I thought, I wonder if that person put any thought whatsoever into that note. Perspective. When you step back and you look at perspective, is it a problem or is it a puzzle? I want you to see it as a puzzle. But here's the way that most people dodge problems. They use denial, avoidance, blame shifting, Minimizing, hyper control, manipulation, and would you add one more called addiction? Denial, avoiding, blame shifting, minimizing, hyper controlling, being manipulative, or using addiction. Albert Einstein said problems cannot be solved by the same level of thinking that created them. But I can tell you this if you avoid thinking about the problem, you can't get through it at all. And that's the most common thing that happens in our country when people have a problem. Instead of seeing it as a puzzle, they think, how can I find somebody else to blame? Instead of seeing it as a puzzle to solve, it's how can I get drunk enough to not think about this problem or high enough or addicted to pornography or gambling or whatever their escapism shopping. They're looking for a way, Calgon take me away or chocolate take me away, instead of I need to sit down with a legal pad and a pen and maybe a trusted advisor to figure this out. Jay, you like to invent things. That's a problem, a puzzle to be solved. If it wasn't for the greatness of individuals who invented things, because instead of seeing it as, well, there'll never be electric light, of being able to say, well, I can fix that. Puzzles to be solved. You don't have to maybe fire all the people in your life. Maybe you just have to solve a puzzle in you. Maybe there's a weakness in you that you, you, you hang out with the wrong people. I see that a lot, especially with young people or college-age people. They hang out with people because they're so lonely, they'd rather be with somebody than be alone. And so they hang out with people because there's always room in the bad crowd. Have you noticed that? There's always room in the bad crowd. But wouldn't it be great if you just would go hang out at the library? If you would go hang out with people in the same clubs or trade associations that believe the things you do? Or here's one. Maybe go find a church where people believe like you and then you're not lonely because then together with other people you're making a difference in the world. Seeing it as a puzzle instead of a problem. Now here's some questions to ask yourself. Is there something I can do to make my life worse? Is there something I can do to make my life better? And you see the next one, would you circle it? Do you believe you get to make that choice? Because I believe you do. I believe that you do. Now here's a formula. Remember, I've been a counselor and a life coach 30 years. Here's the formula. On one side is the avoiding problem side. The other side is the solving puzzle side. Here we go. One side is about lies. It's not my fault. Everybody else is wrong, I'm right, okay? Lies. As opposed to looking at it. A significant part of what I do in a safe conversation is to help people look at their life. Instead of saying, oh no, oh no, he'll change. He said this is the last time he's going to get drunk and do that. Listen, when, when somebody says that, I like to say, well, how many times has it happened? 25 years. Listen, the problem 
I'll never forget one mom <coughs> said, Dwight, you have to help me solve my problem. My son is bankrupting me. I said, well, tell me what's happening. She said, he smokes marijuana. He's currently down in Costa Rica on an extended surfing trip. And she said, he is just bankrupting me. He's 22 years old. And I said, okay, let me get this straight. He's on a surfing trip and he's smoking weed and he's sleeping with girls. He's getting drunk and hanging out. But he's in Costa Rica at, at a resort. Who's paying for this? She said, well, he stole my credit card. I said, I can solve your problem. 1-800-AMERICAN-EXPRESS, we can solve your problem. Hello, American Express, I've done this. American Express, this card has been stolen. And because now, he's at a resort, hanging out, surfing with girls. You're at home, busting your butt to try to make payments to American Express. I can fix this problem. Because now, what we need to do is we need to take your problems and give these problems to your son to be able to see that things cost money. And it's not mom's job to pay for your vacation or for you to be irresponsible. It is unfortunate what happened in your past, but you're not condemned to have to keep paying for that, right? What a novel concept. So as you take a look at it, it's either lie or look at it. It's either escape or it's evaluated. To escape is where people literally are going through a divorce or a foreclosure or a bankruptcy. They just let the mail pile up. Uh, a friend of mine going through his second divorce and went over to check on him, and there were stacks of unopened mail. And I said, what is that? He said, I just don't have the courage to face it. I said, they're going to come take your house. They're going to come take your car. You have to look at this. You have to, instead of escaping it, you have to evaluate it. You'd be shocked how many times with collection agencies. Uh, I teach a training once a year for mediators working with people who are losing their homes through foreclosure. And in training those mediators to train people who are getting 30, 50 harassing phone calls a day, instead of avoiding the phone calls to pick up the phone, and have a conversation. At least look at it, and here you go, best takeaway quote, you always have options. And to be able to ask questions, because you can't get blood out of a turnip. If you avoid, frequently, they'll just put charge on top of charge on top of charge until it's just ridiculous. If you say, let's look at it and tell me my options, key question, key coaching question, what are my options in this situation? What are my options? Remember, you always have options. I talked to my kids when they were little. Thinking wrong is thinking that problems go away. If you ignore them, they don't go away, they get bigger. Instead of thinking through it, solving the puzzle. Tossing it instead of talking about it. That's why people go to Vegas or why they go get, use substances to hide because they're, they're trying to toss that problem out of their life. I'm gonna wash that man right out of my hair. Instead of saying, let's talk through this because so much of counseling and coaching and mentoring and discipleship is just having a safe place to talk. Instead of talking to the bartender about it, talk to a trusted person about it. Talking through it instead of tossing it away. And then finally, the one side is about stuffing it. The better choice is to solve it. To be able to solve a problem, listen to this, I love this. This person said, I have five siblings, three sisters, two brothers. One night I was chatting with my mom about how she had changed so much as a mother from the first child until the last and now changed even more as a grandmother. She said she had mellowed a lot over the years. She said, when your oldest sister coughed or sneezed, I called an ambulance. But when your younger brother swallowed a dime, I just told him it was coming out of his allowance. <laughs> I thought that was a pretty good way, pretty, pretty good take on it of being able to say, hey, let's solve this problem. This is from uh, my, the research I did. I thought this was kind of nice. Four types of problems. Three are known. One is unknown. It's not in your study guide. A known problem. You need a solution. It just takes action and courage to take the step. Known problem. A known problem, the solution requires additional expertise. So you go to the library, you find a counselor, you find a coach, you find a mentor, you listen to some CDs. You just need some additional expertise. A known problem, the solution requires creative approaches. All right, that's especially where coaching comes in. To be able to say, let's think outside the box, let's solve this problem. But listen, an unknown problem, then you do the research to think to identify the solution to the problem. God gave you and I a brain. We are allowed to use it to solve problems. In fact, it delights God when instead of panicking, if we come to him and say, Lord, help me through this. And if you'll take a look in your study guide, I've got some, some resources and some steps to take us there. Why do people keep making the same old problems? Experience, and would you write next to that RAS, Reticular Activation System. Reticular activation system. 
Because the RAS is when the brain keeps doing something. If you keep saying, I'm never going to get through this problem, I'm never going to get through this problem, your brain will create a pathway, a neurological pathway, that's like a super highway. Like 10 lanes on, on, on uh, the you know, Interstate 10 in a major city, Houston or Los Angeles. If you keep saying, I'm never going to get through this, I'm never going to get through this, it reinforces a problem. Watch this. When you start saying, with God's help, I can get through this. Now you're creating a new pathway. Experience, enjoyment is why some people keep the same old problem. So a lady in front of me at Chipotle this week picking up uh, some stuff to take home. <coughs> and her t-shirt said, I killed a 12-pack. And she was at least a senior citizen. And I thought, why would you put that on a t-shirt? Why would you wear that on a t-shirt to be so proud that you, you killed a 12-pack and it was the name of some particular beer? And I thought, that's a really interesting. That person has an interesting story. I didn't have time to hear it because I'd like to find out. Tell me about your story. When, when you see someone, because people will tell you what they believe. We were at a Gator game, and, and we saw a t-shirt, and on one side it said, in big bold letters, everyone believes in something. And I thought, oh, a fellow believer. <laughs> on the back it said, I believe I'll have another beer. And I thought, oh, apparently a Florida State fan. I mean, I didn't know exactly <laughs> how that worked. <laughs> Obviously not a Gator Nation, no. It was yeah. a blue shirt, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember the color of the shirt, Tim. But look at this. <laughs> Biblical examples of people and problems. People who solved the problem. Joseph at the hand of his brothers. Joseph's a great example of solving puzzles. Pharaoh and the Egyptians. Joseph uh, solved that problem for Pharaoh. And then Moses was able to help with the problem of the Pharaoh. Aaron at the tragic death of his sons. David at the death of his child. The parable of the prodigal son is an example of solving a puzzle. In that Luke 15 passage, it's looking for a lost sheep, a lost coin, and a lost son, and not stopping working the puzzle pieces until you have the solution. Paul and Silas in prison. I believe that failure is an event, so you don't have to take it personal. In fact, turn to somebody at your table and say, don't take it personal. Just turn to somebody and say, don't take it personal. Don't take it personal. Don't take it personal. Now, here we go. The Bible has a lot to say. Here's what I want you to see. Look at how the Bible will take it from a problem to being able to change your perspective to help you solve a puzzle. Here we go in Luke 18.1. Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them they should always pray, circle it, and not give up. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We don't even know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans and words that cannot express. Romans 8.26. Listen to Philippians 4.6. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. What happens? The peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard, circle it, your heart and your mind. Your heart, the center of your emotions, your mind, the center of your cognition. When you're able to pray about it instead of panic about it, you now no longer have pain and problems. You start to get creative solutions because you're saying, God, I don't know how we're going to get through this, but I trust you. Faith is an acrostic, forsaking all I trust him. Back in the scriptures, in uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances. Gee, I got held up and I wasn't able to leave the house at the time I wanted. Gee, look at the ambulance and the fire trucks on the side of the road. Maybe you would have been in that accident. Don't second guess God. Give thanks in all things. First Chronicles 16, 11, look to the Lord and his strength. Seek his face always. Remember the wonders he has done. Remember his miracles. When you can sit down and start to count blessings, all of a sudden you're not as afraid of your problems. Because you realize, well, God carried me through. God carried me through in the past. God will carry me through today. And then finally, 1 Timothy 2, 8. Watch this. I want men everywhere to lift up holy hands in prayer without anger or disputing. Now, here's how this works. Here's how this works. All right? Take a hand, hold it up, and then open it. God, you put anything into my life that you want. Okay? So this is how the Christian lives his life. God, you put in anything you want. Take the other hand. Make a fist. God, how dare you? Shake that fist. All right? Now look around. Who would you rather give a blessing to? When God looks at us, if we're like, you caused all my problems. Where do you put a blessing 
if your hand is closed into a fist. When Paul wrote to Timothy, he said, I want people to raise up holy hands in worship. 80% of the world was in slavery. How could you hold your hand up in worship? Read Maya's book, I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings. You sing because you have a song in your heart, not because your life is perfect. This world isn't perfect. Remember the old song, this world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's distant shore, and I can't be at home in this world anymore. If everything was perfect here, why do we need heaven? Some people spend all their time and their money trying to get perfect here, and they don't spend any time and money getting to know God until it's too late. So here's some observations on managing major problems in life. Number one, problems happen to everybody. Problems happen to everybody. You got problems, I got problems, all God's children got problems. Problems help us to grow. Solving puzzles helps us grow. Problems build our faith. Problems make us more sympathetic with others. Problems make us heavenly minded. Problems prove true the promises of God. Prom uh, problems show that God's grace is sufficient. Problems allow us to share in Christ's suffering, 2 Corinthians 12. Problems prepare us to help others. I love the story of the only survivor of a shipwreck washed up on a small uninhabited island. He prayed feverishly for God to rescue him. And every day he scanned the horizon for help, but he saw no help coming. Exhausted, he eventually managed to build a little hut out of driftwood to protect him from the elements and to store a few possessions. But one day after scavenging for food, he arrived home to find his little hut was up in flames. With the smoke rolling into the sky, the worst had happened. He had lost everything, and he was bitter and stung with grief and anger. He shook his fist up at God and said, God, how could you do this to me? The exact time on the next day, however, he was awakened by the sound of a ship that was approaching the island. The ship had come to rescue him. How did you know I was here, the weary man said to his rescuers. Well, we saw your smoke signal yesterday and decided to come check it out. How many times do we say, God, why did you, with a job, or what somebody says, or a broken car, how many times do we do that instead of saying, I don't know why you gave me cancer, but maybe it's to show the world that there's a difference. My friend Steve Brown says every time that a pagan goes through bankruptcy and foreclosure, he believes that God allows a Christian to go through bankruptcy and foreclosure to show the world there's a difference. Every time a pagan gets cancer, Steve said, I believe that God allows a Christian to get cancer to show the world there's a difference. And I could hug you and kiss your face because you, Pat Williams, showed the world there was a difference. The mission is remission. And you've had such an incredible opportunity to speak the, the, the wisdom and the wealth and the goodness of God's grace because of a platform that you didn't want called cancer that today allows people who have cancer to say, I want the faith of the Pat Williams. Tell me about your Jesus. That's the difference in perspective. It's, Dwight, I didn't want this problem. I, didn't, I don't know that any, you know, God doesn't say, excuse me, Craig. Do you mind if I give you something to solve today? God doesn't ask our opinion about anything. But we get handed stuff every day, and it delights a father when his child can say, ah, I got it. It delights parents when their children actually do their term papers and projects instead of stealing them from Wikipedia. It delights us when we see that our children actually learn some. Wow! How much more does it delight God when we say, you handed me a problem in this thing with my mom's health care, but you know what? God, with your help, I think we can get through this. That delights God, and it makes you stronger. I've come to like these things called word clouds, and I put it into your study guide. It's where they do research, and then instead of coming out back in statistical analysis, they put it into a series of words. And, on, and when I did a word, proud, uh, word cloud, as it's called, on problems, answers, solutions, mind, mistakes, because solving a problem obviously involves mistakes, trial and error, trial and error, trial and error, trial and error, and then eventually trial success, trial success, trial success. We're always learning. We're always growing. At Walmart, they have a saying, 1% better. Hey. Tomorrow, do it 1% better. Tomorrow, do it 1% better. Largest retailer in the world. How did they get there? They didn't get there the way that Kmart or Sears. They just kept saying, let's just make it 1% better. Just 1% better. So as you take a look at this, let me give you one last formula. To manage your problems well. Here we go. The W stands for worship. In the book of Job, Job lost everything. His health, his children, his wealth. 
his name, his reputation. And the Bible tells us that Job said, Naked I came from my mother's womb. Naked I'll return to the grave. The Lord has given. The Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You live like life like this and you lose everything, you now found everything. Because it starts with worship. The E is to evaluate. To evaluate. Robert Schuller said, problems are not stop signs. Problems are guidelines. Evaluation is what a coach does. It's being able to do what I call a web of your life. You see the circles in your study guide? Or if you're watching at calmclass.com, you downloaded the study guide uh, through the PDF, and there's a series of, of circles. In the middle, you write your name. And then you put the date. Because to web out a series of problems, to evaluate problems, you put in your name, you put in the date, and then in those circles, those circles out on the side, in one you write health, in one you write career, in one you write family, or one you write faith. And when I'm sitting and I'm talking to an executive, and, then, and, and I'll say, tell me what's going on in your life. I'll sit there and I'll start drawing a web. And it's called a web because it ends up looking like a spider web. Because then, for instance, in the area of health, you might put weight or sleep or medication. In faith, you might put quiet time or mindset. Family, you might put marriage or friends or children. Career, you might put your boss or taxes or finances. You just, you just keep drawing different things. And now, instead of having a bunch of problems in your head, we have problems on paper that we can develop some solutions about. It starts with worship, God help me. It then goes into evaluation. I said it's a well formula because the next L is to listen. Listen to Psalms 27. Hear my voice when I call, O Lord. Be merciful to me and answer me. My heart says of you, seek his face. Your face, Lord, I will seek. So how to deal with the pressures? Face your problem. Give your pain to God through prayer. Put your problems into perspective. This is counting blessings instead of counting problems. If you just do that one, if you just do that one, you'll have less anxiety. Put the past behind you. Prepare to take action. Express your personal feelings and fears. Seek people in your community as well as other supports. And finally, discover and practice healthy coping skills. Now, when I say healthy coping skills, do you see that big sign I put in your study guide? It says, face your problems, don't Facebook your problems. Every week, I go to the Orange County Public Library. Sometimes I come out with stacks. Once, you have a, once you're an established card holder at the Orange County Public Library, you can check out 100 items. 100 items, which will usually get me through the week. Sometimes two. Uh, and, and sometimes it's, it's jazz music, because I like to listen to jazz music. You know, Charlie Parker or, or, or Miles Davis, some of that classic stuff from the 1940s. Before I was here, they had good music. I'm not sure exactly what Lady Gaga adds to the conversation. I never really check out any of her music, but apparently it's not as popular as it once was. But boy, Miles Davis is timeless. Listen to the wisdom from other people, but the last piece, please don't miss. Live. How many people... Born 1955, died 1995, buried 2035. They're a walking zombie. They never lived. To live, to really live, that's the key. To be able to say, there's a solution to this. There's a solution. I can do that. Ralph Waldo Emerson said, I have a premonition. It soars on silver wings. A dream of your accomplishments and other wondrous things. I do not know beneath which sky or where you'll challenge fate. I only know it will be high. I only know that you will be great. And he wrote that almost 100 years ago because the great thinkers throughout time were not afraid to say, it's just a puzzle. Don't be afraid. It's not a problem. It's just a puzzle. And you can do this. I believe you can. Let's pray for that. Father, thank you for these friends. Thank you for the opportunity to help people see it's just a series of puzzles to solve. It's not a problem. Help each of us to help each other with the wisdom you taught us today, dear God. And I pray this in Christ's holy name. Amen. Amen. Hi, Dwight Bain here. And I want to tell you about CalmClass.com. The website that you came to is actually a teaching lesson that we record in Orlando, Florida every single week. You can actually come be part of the live audience. If you're in Florida, maybe you're visiting the Orlando area, come check us out. We meet at 3000 South John Young Parkway. It's on the campus of First Baptist Orlando, which is actually a pretty large place. So what you're looking for is a large building by a lake. It's a big three-story building called Faith Hall. And we're in Faith Hall upstairs in room 301. But if you don't get a chance to come live to the presentation in Orlando, 
then if these lessons about making your life work better, to get past frustration in relationships, maybe frustrations on the job, maybe you're just kind of feeling beat up about what you believe. If you enjoy these lessons, would you do me a favor? Would you tell a friend? Because by your experience of telling other people, hey, this website helped me, these lessons helped me, when you're doing that, you're helping take the message that we teach in Orlando and to be able to spread that to the entire world. And thanks.